Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our um, final ISCF sustainability webinar in the series. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all here. I'm Victoria Whitehouse uh, and I'm the Deputy Director for the Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge um, and I'm chairing today's, uh, today's panel. So we uh, have got a super panel um, lined up for you today um, and an opportunity um, for you to ask any questions that um, you might think of during, um, during the session. Um, so it, please do put your questions in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, and this can be during the presentations as well. Um, uh, that's, that's not a problem. And we'll see what we can get through um, at the end of the session. So um, I'm going to actually kick off the session with an overview of, of my programme, the Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge, and what we're doing to tackle climate change. So firstly, we know that industry emits a lot of greenhouse gases in the UK. About a sixth of greenhouse gases come from industry. We also know that significant decarbonisation in industry is needed by the 2030s and government has set um, targets to cut emissions by two thirds by 2035 and over 90% by 2050 to reach net zero. And I think it's important to say from the outset that decarbonising industry is quite difficult and complicated they use massive amounts of power. So using decarbonised power is really important. But there are some things that you just can't make without um, CO2 being produced as a byproduct. Um, and this is where we need to find ways of capturing and storing the CO2 at scale across the UK. Um, but we also know that this will be expensive with each region likely to cost into the tens of billions of pounds to decarbonize. So the industrial decarbonization challenge um, was established to kick start the process of decarbonizing major industrial clusters um, with the approach being that they could come together um, to share infrastructure and de-risk investment. But we also know that the cluster sites themselves are, um, are complicated. There are many industries operating within a regional cluster. So the challenge that they also face is how they are going to collaborate so that all businesses are able to take advantage of carbon capture and storage infrastructure. So our programme totals about 500 million, um, of which about 210 million is public money and the rest is coming from industry. And we're supporting five clusters to decarbonise in the UK. Um, and these are in uh, South Wales, the North West, Scotland, Teesside and Humber. And what you'll notice um, about those regions that these are all coastal locations, um, which actually provides the UK with an advantage um, to adopt this carbon capture and storage um, technology. And I also want to mention at this point that these projects are not research projects, they're, they're, they're doing this for real and developing infrastructure at scale across the UK. And their focus on carbon capture and storage, which I've mentioned, and that's the process by which we capture carbon dioxide from emissions in industry and store it permanently offshore under the seas and oceans uh, around the UK. The projects are also looking uh, and focusing on producing hydrogen and distributing this in pipelines at scale so industry and domestic users um, can get access to that. So by funding these projects, we are supporting the government's ambitions to establish at least four 
significantly decarbonise regions in the UK by 2030 and one net zero industrial cluster by 2040. And that will be the wor world's first, which is a, um, an amazing ambition um, that, that, that will take place. And in support of these big infrastructure projects that, we, that we're funding, we also um, provide funding to develop cluster regions for the long term and make sure that they are self-sustaining. And finally, we have a research programme called the Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre, which is led by uh, Professor Mercedes Morota Guilar at Harriet Watt University. So that's a, a sort of brief overview of the Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge. Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, and we have a great panel today. And what they're going to do is they're going to take you through what their challenges are doing to tackle climate change. So next up, we have Sam Stacey, who is the Challenge Director for the Transforming Construction Challenge, which is looking at creating new construction processes and techniques in the UK. Over to you, Sam. Thank you very much, Vicky. There we go. So yes, um, uh, transforming construction. So this challenge has been going for just over three years. And we started out with these frankly quite daunting targets to lower emissions from the built environment by 50%, lower costs by a third, faster delivery, uh, improving the balance of trade and improving productivity. And for those who don't know, the backdrop of the construction industry is typically 2% margins um, and uh, flatlining productivity for, for many years. But what I'm delighted to be able to, to report is that our experience uh, with the investments that we've made is that we can feel really confident that these targets are achievable now. Uh, and also coming along with that is I, I think uh, uh, we've revealed that there are some fantastic business opportunities associated with this. So what we're hoping for is a real waking, waking up of investment with regards to these techniques. Certainly the world has changed or the priorities have changed literally in the three years that we've been working. So, you know, we set out to, to fix the construction industry and get it working as a, a better system. But with this enormous increase in focus on net zero, it's really pulled through a lot of what we're doing. So the clients of our industry are making bold demands. And you know, one of my message to the industry is get ahead of the game. We know how to do it. We've shown the way. We've de-risked a lot of this. Uh, so now, now is the time to, to be bold. Uh, a few years ago, uh, someone called Sir John Egan recommended that the construction industry learned from the automotive sector. And that was really about efficiency then. But I think there's another important message now, which is that if you look at Tesla, Tesla is you know, the standout company that has had a clear net zero strategy um, and they're worth to shareholders vastly more than any other um, car company. And I think similar sort of uh, opportunities exist with regards to construction. I've got an image here of, um, uh, BlackRock's letter to, to, to the CEO. So BlackRock, which manages $9 trillion worth of assets, is saying, you know, now is the time to get out there and be bold about decarbonisation and uh, reorient your business strategy towards decarbonisation. So I'm going out there talking to loads of people in the construction industry and, and saying you've got to lead in scaling these, these uh, outputs and solutions for the industry. Scale this standardized manufacturing approach to construction, the kit of parts approach to construction. Uh, really accelerate the digital and data driven processes in construction which have uh, been lagging and embed a whole life value approach to construction projects, to procuring and delivering construction projects. And that is in contrast to just trying to knock down the, the, the capital uh, expenditure to, to an absolute minimum, which has been frankly the, the prevailing approach in construction. 
So with the Transforming Construction Challenge, we've laid the foundations for this transformation and this uh, scale up in techniques. We've defined what we, what we mean by the, the, the value-based approach. We've defined the platform approach. We've proven with our portfolio of uh, uh, CR&D and demonstrator projects that these approaches do indeed work. And absolutely fundamentally, we've shifted public procurement. The public sector procures something between 30 and, uh, and 50 billion pounds worth of construction projects each year. So massive client, massive um, uh, 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 demand side pull um, on the construction sector. And I think that's a key driver for change. So just to explain what I mean uh, by the value and the platform approach. So the value toolkit is, is a toolkit for clients who are procuring buildings to enable them to take into account all the factors that they should be thinking about when procuring buildings. So we're not being prescriptive about how they weight the different factors, but they, uh, we, we, we enable them to think about the effect on the natural environment, the effect on society, uh, the effect on jobs and the economy, as long, along with uh, return on investment in the sort of traditional sense. The platform rulebook is about standardizing the interfaces between buildings as kits of parts. And I'm talking big assemblies there as kits of parts. So actually our, our program has defined typical buildings as consisting of 13 different essential assemblies. Uh, and what we've defined there is the interface between those assemblies and the performance requirement for those parts. And the idea then is that the, the market goes out there and innovates and produces the best possible parts within that controlled system. But along with that comes, comes quality, economies of scale, efficiency, and all those things. And then we've got this, as I say, this, this portfolio of demonstrator projects, 51 uh, as it happens. And time after time, we've seen that these dramatic improvements are possible from taking these approach. So I haven't got time to, to, to go through um, many examples of this, but certainly relevant today are, is this example. This is the uh, active building technology that we're developing, principally through the Active Building Center. So testing, validating, and configuring clean energy technology for buildings, uh, improving some of the core technologies, the heat pumps, for example, energy storage, We've got some fantastic facilities, some demonstrator projects to show that this works. And we've already started working with several clients to show just how feasible and practical and affordable these techniques are. And I mentioned one other project from that portfolio is Hyperpile. So we've worked with a, a consortium of organizations there to make, well, without doubt, the biggest advance in piling um, uh, pile foundations for the last 50 years. Hollow precast piles uh, with sensors and uh, heat exchange loops in them to capture energy from uh, the, the ground. Uh, and this is uh, proving very popular and, and very successful. Uh, and then public procurement. So what's happened there is uh, on the back of our program, uh, they, the, the public sector um, has published this construction playbook, which is the guidance for the five government departments that uh, procure buildings to basically say, you must adopt the techniques that we've developed. So what that does is that breaks down the, the, the uh, barrier to adoption or the, the fear from the point of view of innovators that, you know, they can spend all this money and make all this effort to innovate, but they're not gonna get take up from the market. But this represents a guarantee that the market is gonna pick up their solutions. We've also piloted this on various public sector assets. So uh, schools is one example where we've designed uh, two standard schools, generative design, you put in your inputs and the sort of computer does much of the rest. Architectural talent is applied to make sure that these schools fit into their, their local environment and you know that you, you, you fine tune the specifics to the site. But fundamentally, net zero schools, 
uh, made efficiently using this kit of parts uh, and something that can be rolled out, um, you know, across the, uh, the, the, the new build school program. Uh, so this is my last slide. This is really to say we've, we've got this platform approach that can be applied to a massive portfolio of uh, construction projects. We're also seeing enthusiastic take up from uh, some of the private sector developers. We've got this, uh, not because of us, but there is this, this uh, 650 billion uh, pipeline of government procurement that has been published and lots of support and massive enthusiasm for the, the mission to decarbonize uh, the, the, the built environment, the, the built environment uh, emitting somewhere between 20 and 40% of total carbon emissions, depending on how you measure it. So that's what transforming construction um, has been up to. Um, and on that note, I'd be happy to hand back to Vicky. Thanks, Sam. Some, uh, some really uh, interesting stuff going on there um, that you've highlighted, uh, particularly the sort of active building technologies that, that I was uh, quite interested in. Um, so if I could now um, introduce Marika Schmidt, who is Head of Innovation at Innovate UK and working on the Prospering from the Energy Revolution Challenge, uh, looking at accelerating innovation in smart local energy systems, Marika. Yes, so my name is Marika, um, and the focus really of the prospering from the energy revolution uh, program is on smart local energy systems. Next slide, please. So to reach net zero by 2050, we need radical change. And I think that's come across um, all week um, as part of the COP26 um, conference. We need new approaches um, to energy, and there's a huge opportunity in smart, integrated local systems, giving consumers cleaner, cheaper energy and building local prosperity. Let me explain a little bit about what smart local energy systems are. Um, right at the beginning of our program, we actually asked our research consortium uh, to come up with a definition. It's not that easy. Um, there are key, a couple of key elements though to consider. So in the UK, we've had mainly had a national sort of energy system. So large scale um, energy generation um, distributed um, via um, a network trans transmission system. Um, we are moving towards a more localized system though. And the reason for that is um, obviously the emergence of renewable energy systems. Um, because they should ideally be used where they are generated um, and you don't want to transport them across um, the whole country, ideally. Um, so smart local energy systems is a range of technologies and we often, um, you know, we need to bring them together and manage them. So optimizing supply and demand um, and that's often done at the local level. Next slide, please. So the power of local, really important to understand this in the context of our program. Um, more than half of the emission cuts needed rely on people and businesses taking up low carbon solutions and decisions that are made at the local and individual level. And top-down policies um, go some way in delivering these solutions, but we can achieve a far greater impact if the focus is on local knowledge and networks. And that's a quote from the Committee for Climate Change. Next slide. So what's the Prospering from the Energy Revolution uh, program all about? It's a UKRI program. It's part of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. Um, it's 102 million of public funding. It's matched by industry uh, and it's running from 2019 to 2023. And we have over 50 projects ar around the UK. The aim is really to show what works in terms of smart local um, energy systems, and they can have all sorts of sizes. Next slide, please. PFI numbers, um, so 102 million, um, we always ask for co-investment. So we have 216 million of extra investment expected from industry and partners, and that brings us up to a total of 380 million. 
um, as you can see here, um, we have a wide range of consortia involved in this, ranging from companies through to local authorities and public bodies and universities. Next slide. And these are where some of our projects are. Um, so we have large scale demonstrator projects and multi-million pound programs, but we also have detailed concept and detailed design projects. And that's really about um, planning smart local energy systems um, for implementation. And then we have also key technology component pro um, projects, which are all about improving the technology that, that we require to um, deliver smart local energy systems. Increasingly, data and digitalization is, is, is really important. So we also have projects to actually look at energy data and how you can use digitalization um, for um, some of the solutions that we need to, to, to optimize um, demand and supply, supply in the energy system. Next slide. And I just want to give you some examples of some of the projects that um, you know, we are currently delivering. Um, there's not that much time, but I'm going to, so I'm going to pick one project, which is the Ref Reflex project that we're delivering in Orkney. So Orkney is an island, um, and what we're doing there is um, we are installing renewable energy technology, so wind and solar. Um, we are providing EV cars via a leasing arrangement. So obviously we're also installing EV chargers. Um, we are looking at the homes in Orkney um, to make them sort of more energy efficient. Um, so um, also including um, installing heat uh, controls, heating controls. Uh, and finally, obviously, because it's a smart local energy system, what we're trying to do is optimize supply and demand so that the customer gets the best solution. So if you like, we're providing an energy service. I think that's a really important point to understand about smart local energy system. We're trying to find the best solution for the customer to save them energy and, and to also manage uh, supply and demand um, at the local and sub-regional level in a better way. Next slide. Some of the light bulb moments from, from the program that I just want to talk about, because obviously we're looking at, um, you know, all of the learnings um, so far as we are halfway through the program. I think it's really important to stress that local delivery structures are important. We often have um, local authorities involved in, in our programs, um, but also bigger companies that sort of take the role of a project developer. And it's really important um, to understand that it's almost impossible to develop a smart local energy systems, a system if, if local actors don't work together. And the coordination of that in terms of delivery is really um, quite crucial to success. Capacity and capabilities. Um, what we're finding particularly at the local authority level is um, there's often only one or two people that look at climate change and energy, um, particularly in smaller lo locations. So it's an issue with capacity. Um, a lot of the funding that was available in terms of um, technical assistance um, is no longer available as a, as a result of Brexit. Um, so there's a need to build capacity um, and also to build capabilities. I think the two go hand in hand. Um, it's not that easy to deliver a smart local energy systems uh, from a practical point of view, because you have to bring together lots of different actors um, and, and actually, actually the, the operational delivery of it is, is also, also requires a lot of coordination. So capabilities is a key consideration. The role of public finance. Um, obviously, the uh, National Infrastructure Bank um, has emerged in the UK. Um, what, we've, what we were finding as part of the programme is that project financing can be a challenge. And the reason for that is that smart local energy systems are more complex Investors are used to look at um, investments in, in asset classes. Obviously, if you combine several technologies and you manage it via digital appliances, that's a totally different ball game. Um, and so there is a need to de-risk some of these projects before the relevant um, finance can be, can be sought. And the um, National Infrastructure Bank could obviously play a very important role uh, in in helping there, for example, with cornerstone funding or guarantees to get these really important um, projects off the ground. Incentivizing the delivery of smart local energy systems. Um, 
really important point. Um, what we're finding uh, is because we have a national energy system at the moment, we're not incentivizing the delivery of um, smart local energy systems. The sort of generation isn't incentivized um, in the right localities at the moment. And that causes issues if you want to um, develop and deliver smart local energy systems. Um, and finally, fostering community participation, really important um, that these smart local energy systems are developed for the people and with the people. Um, it, it really doesn't work if you install lots of new tech without getting everyone on board with, with it and, and, and helping people to understand um, how the future will look like. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Marika. I thought it was really um, good to see such a diverse range of projects that you've got um, and all around the country as well. So that was um, that was really insightful. Thank you. Um, so uh, next up, we have um, Bruce Adderley, who is the Challenge Director for Transforming Foundation Industries, which is looking at innovative technologies to reduce energy and resource use within the foundation industries. Bruce, over to you. Thank you, Vicky. Um, so uh, I imagine that a number of you are wondering uh, what the Transforming Foundation Industries Challenge is all about. Uh, and if I was to try and distill it down uh, and to what I hope to make clear over the next few minutes is that it's about making the material foundations of our society sustainable. The foundation industries are those that predominantly supply the materials they produce to other industries who then turn them into 70 to 70, 70 to 75% of absolutely everything that's manufactured that you'll be able to see as you look around yourself, whether you're sat at home right now in an office or, or out and about somewhere. Uh, and they include the metals, cement, chemicals, ceramics, paper and glass industries. So as a challenge, and this is what it says in our mission statement, we're about transforming these industries so that they're internationally competitive at the same time as being environmentally sustainable. If I was to very gener generically describe these industries, they take raw materials and they heat them up a lot as they convert them into the refined materials that we all recognize. But doing this takes lots of energy and lots of raw materials. So the challenge is to make these industries more energy and more resource efficient which will in turn be a significant element of their route to decarbonisation and our net zero future. So at the outset of the challenge, our aim was to get these industries to innovate collaboratively in solving problems that they all have, but which they've been struggling to address individually. I'm pleased to say that we're achieving this with more than 50 such projects already up and running, as well as cross industry actions on skills, equality, diversity and inclusion, and giving those earlier in the career some of the opportunities they need en route to becoming the leaders of the future as they will be the people who are going to deliver on net zero. Spanning a TRL spectrum of roughly three to seven or eight, we have established the following. A new EPSRC-led Network Plus bringing together the UK's leading ac academics in relation to the foundation industries. The Transfire Hub led by Cranfield University where already nearly 100 organisations are working to make these industries more resource, resource efficient. A wide ranging collaborative R&D programme and an investor partnership programme where highly innovative SMEs are supported by both ourselves and private equity partners to rapidly deliver new innovations and build their businesses. Lastly, but not least, and in combination with Liverpool City Region and industry partners, we're supporting the creation of the Glass Futures led pilot plant facility in St Helens in the northwest of England. If any of you have been lucky enough to be at the COP Green Zone over the last two weeks, I hope you'll have had a chance to visit them there. Now, in making all this happen, we realised that we did set off with the right idea, but also that we had and still have much to learn. At times, it's not been easy, uh, not been an easy process to enable the creation of cross industries consortia targeting resource and energy efficiency improvements and there are several key barriers that we've identified and that we must continue to address as we move forward unfortunately there's not time to go into the detail of those now 
but I'd urge you to look up our report on innovation readiness in the foundation industries that was published earlier this year. Most interesting for me, though, has been the rapid ascendance of through supply chain resource efficiency as a focus for these industries. When we set out two years ago, it was arguably an area that needed addressing, but in which relatively few were acting. But now we find innovative new projects arising right across these industries and their supply chains all the time. Back in December 2020, the Committee on Climate Change published its six carbon budgets and really made clear for the first time just how significant improvement in resource uh, efficiency across these industries and more widely in industry will be in meeting that mid 2030s carbon budget and hence our ability to deliver on the route to 2050 and net zero. Since then, we've seen the World Economic Forum report on how the world cannot meet its climate change targets without addressing this issue. We've also seen, for example, the Aldersgate Group working directly on this issue, engaging with the foundation industry companies and developing policy proposals that will support the needed outcomes. Crucially, they identify the need for so-called demand-led innovation, where public and private buyers commit to procuring sustainable materials and are prepared to work with their supply chains to deliver these through processes and business models that are sustainable in all ways. It's therefore been great to see the announcement this week through the Clean Energy Ministerial and the Deep Carbon Initiative that the UK, Indian, German and Canadian governments have committed to buy low carbon steel and concrete. And you'll have seen from what Sam said earlier, just why the UK government now has confidence to do that. As Sam said, this represents up to 40% of the relevant domestic markets and gives companies confidence to invest in such materials. And within three years, the initiative aims to have at least 10 countries making that level of commitment. Now, whilst this is a great example of what is needed, it is limited to steel, cement, the construction sector and public procurement. What we need is for this principle to be widely accepted and acted upon across both the public and private sector, multiple customer sectors, for example, packaging, automotive and aerospace, and involving all the material produced by the foundation industries. Just take packaging, for example. An initiative in this area would involve glass, paper and metals and consumers across multiple markets. So to achieve a sustainable future for these industries and hence our society as a whole, I'd argue that we must come together and demand that this change happens, but also be prepared to work through supply chains to deliver this transition in a way that is just for all. Thank you. Great, thanks, Bruce. Um, I think it's it's amazing to see the progress that has been made across the foundation industries um, from the work that you're doing in the challenge. So, so thank you for that. Um, some really great insight. So. Um, if I could now hand over to Jackie Murray, um, who is the Deputy Challenge Director for the Faraday Battery Challenge, looking at developing battery technologies and driving growth in the UK battery businesses. Jackie. Good morning, everyone. I've got a mute. Um, hope everyone's doing OK. I'm just trying. I'm failing to share my slides. Um, can you see that, um, Victoria? We can see it in the um, in the slide oh. view, but not the presentation view. Is that better? Give it a few moments. I think it's fine. No, so sorry, Jackie, we're still on the slides, the slide view. Okay, that's a bit weird. Let me just see if I can change the display settings. Is that any better? Or is that yeah, better? yes, that's better. We're there. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, right. So, you know, welcome everyone. Really nice to talk to you this morning. Um, I didn't join the pre-work for this because I've been off with COVID. So um, if I'm coughing or I want, you know, my, my mind wanders, wanders off, um, bear with me and hopefully I'll, I'll at least give you some of the insight on what the Faraday Battery Challenge um, and batteries in particular can do to help us reach net zero. Um, I'm really genuinely hoping there's gonna be lots of questions as well. So um, do pop things in the Q&A and we'll hopefully catch up with them. 
So reaching net zero is um, a really massive task. And the UK actually, from uh, somebody who used to be an ex-environmental regulator, um, an ex-steel worker, um, is really impressive because we've actually regulated, we've actually legislated to get to net zero. Um, and if you look at the um, Climate Change Committee's uh, legislated sixth budget, you'll see these graphs that I'm just putting up here. What they show is the breakdown of how to get to net zero by 2050 is really significant for something called surface, that we call surface transport. In the first gra graph on the, on the left, I'm hoping you can all see that there's a purple line that goes from around 115 uh, million tonnes of CO2 equivalent uh, right down to zero by 2050, and that's surface transport. Um, surface transport or transport take, sort of takes up about 22% of all of those CO2 equivalent tonnes. Um, and what the graph on the right is showing you is that vans and cars um, are really the main um, proportion of that. That's the light green and the light blue on the right hand graph. So being an engineer, you kind of go, right, OK, what are the top things we can do something about? Transport, particularly volume automotive, has been pretty stubborn in terms of emissions. So we've all got better and better at internal combustion engine cars um, and hybrid cars, but actually they've made the vehicles heavier. Um, and some of that weight has come from safety requirements, et cetera. So we now know we've got to really shift. We've really got to move. Um, and I'm lucky enough to work on something called the Faraday Battery Challenge that, that sort of identified this in 2016, um, working with the automotive companies. Um, what's important about batteries is um, actually right here, right now, when we look at the data, we can actually estimate that they'll generate around a third of the amount of carbon um, emissions uh, of, compared to a petrol or diesel vehicle over their life cycle. Now, what I don't want to give you the impression is um, that up front, right, that change to a battery rather than an internal combustion engine is a, is a low energy, zero emission um, thing. You're, you're mining. Uh, you're, you're doing a lot of very advanced manufacturing. You've got some really significant changes um, in how you bring that vehicle to the market. And those tend to be higher. You can see it um, on the, in the graph of the, as, the, as the, the gray and the orange. And you can see as, you, as the batteries get larger, that, that amount uh, increases. But what we do tend to forget is, is the... Um, is the oil and gas element is absolutely huge. It's not just from your the petrol that you have to get the pump. It's it's the entire um, infrastructure to get that pet, petrol and, and gas out of the ground as crude oil refined, etc. So there's a huge comparator, and we know right now, right, you know, that it's about a third. Um, what we also know is, as engineers and entrepreneurs and, and scientists, is that actually by 2050, that number will have dropped again. Those technologies are going to come forward and bring us an even lower um, uh, um, uh, impact vehicle. And the reason for that is we know, you know, actually the manufacture, we, we know how to manufacture really well. We know how to mine better than we did before. We know how to do this stuff. Um, and that's really important because it goes all the way through from you know, raw material extraction, refining, all the way through to end of life recycling. And I'll touch on that a bit more. Uh, what I also wanted to just tell you is Friday Battery Challenge isn't actually around the market in the UK and making everybody who's listening in drive an electric vehicle. It's actually around the manufacturing. Um, and our targets uh, were when we launched four years ago, it was really to bring forward new technologies that reduce the cost. I'm sure that's, if you're looking at buying an electric vehicle, it won't have missed your attention that they're expensive. Um, we're looking at how those batteries and the technology can reduce the energy density, which is your range, um, your power density can increase, and that's your how fast you can charge, and you can also accelerate your vehicle if you want something fast. Um, the safety, the temperature range they can operate well at, how long the first life of the battery lasts, um, the temperature range, predictability, and also the sustainability. And that's complex sustainability. It's, it's, it's not an easy um, question to answer and it's not an easy um, solution. And that's why we're working very hard in this uh, 330 million pound challenge uh, to really bring forward those, 
uh, that collaborative working to get those answers that are right uh, for the future. And it's it's by taking this step, we've got a much better understanding in the UK uh, and can now make better strategic and technical decisions moving forward. Uh, what do we need to consider when we're looking at batteries? Everything from that rock on the left-hand side through to the end of life. Um, we need to think about whether we can use them in a different, in a second life at that end of life um, and all the way through. So actually when you, you guys start thinking about um, I don't know, the, the uh, miles per kilowatt hour efficiency of your vehicle, then we know we're getting somewhere really important. We need to know and have really robust ways to assess um, it, the overall impact. So we talk about life cycle assessment. Um, actually, there's some hazardous substances. We want to make sure that we also regulate modern slavery out. I'm sure people are aware of that with cobalt, um, but also the ecological standards, the environment around the entire supply chain and use of electric vehicles is really understood and minimized. Um, and we also want clean energy. I'm sure people are also aware of um, you know, the need to incorporate recycled materials. And if you look at the latest EVs, they tend to have you know, recycled plastics and then re recycled materials all the way through. Um, we're also looking and as a mission, which is what Faraday sort of um, sort of brings forward is we also consider uh, safety at standards, um, how to bring investors on board and all the other elements. So I think I'll stop now because I'm sure I'm running out of time. But I will leave this one up for people to just have a quick read um, before we finish in terms of all the elements that we're really focused on in the Varada Battery Challenge uh, to bring forward. And yeah, I'd really like to answer your questions. Thanks, Jackie. Um, I think it's really interesting to sort of hear the technological development of, of batteries and everything that you're that you're working on. So um, some really good stuff. Um, uh, the next person that I'm that I'm handing over to is Tom Jenkins, who is deputy director, the deputy challenge director for the Transforming Food Production, um, and it's looking into enhanced product productivity and sustainability across the UK's food sector. Tom. Thanks very much. So as Vicky said, I'm Tom Jenkins, the Deputy Challenge Director for the Transform Food Production Challenge Programme. If we go to the next slide, please, Sue. So the Transform Food Production Programme, that's a 90 million investment that runs up to the end of March 2024. And it's all about how we can help drive efficiency, sustainability, productivity across the UK's agriculture and food sectors. The UK sector itself um, represents about 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. This includes some of the more potent things like methane and nitrous oxide emissions. But if we look globally, it's about a third of emissions come from agriculture. So with that um, climate change and growing world populations, it's a sector that really needs to embrace innovation and produce food in ways that are more efficient and resilient. Within the programme, we're supporting the science base and industry to drive forward integrated precision approaches to allow us to take forward new innovations to support this challenge. And within this, we're looking to drive economic growth, but also to set the sector on a trajectory to net zero emissions by 2040. If we could go to the next slide, please, Sue. So the way that we're distributing that 90 million, we've got four major interventions. Along the bottom in red, we've got 25 million going into what we call the science and technology into practice stream. So this is supporting more traditional agricultural systems. So it's addressing problems and challenges like crop and livestock disease, but also labor availability through things like automation and robotics. Along the top in green, we've got 50 million going into the future food production systems intervention. And this is all about potentially new disruptive ways of producing food. So things like alternative proteins, so think insect farming, single cell fermentations, but also things like controlled environment agriculture. So vertical farming using things like aeroponics in cities or ex brownfield sites. So not going into more traditional environments and producing food in new and different ways. We've also got 5 million going into international partnerships that we're taking forward through co-innovation with the UK and Canada and the UK and China. And within this, we're supporting UK companies to test and trial innovations in rapidly expanding precision agricultural markets in North America and Asia, respectively. And we also have 10 million going into an investor partnership scheme. And this is where we're specifically looking to take forward our grant funding investments 
alongside equity investment, specifically to drive Series A deal flow into UK companies to help them to grow and scale and take their innovations to market. Next slide, please, Sue. So just to give a little bit of colour and flavour in terms of the sorts of things that we've been supporting through our funding, this gives a snapshot of some of those projects that we supported through the um, future food production systems intervention. And within this, we've got five projects in total, but there are three that are looking at that alternative protein production opportunity. They're collectively looking at things like insect farming, algal production, but also advanced fermentations using CO2 as a feedstock to make single cell protein. And they're complementary in terms of they're all looking to try and displace soy meal and fish meal imports that go into both the aquaculture but the wider livestock sector. Aquaculture in particular, something like 80% of the carbon emissions result from the feed inputs coming from South America through things like soy and fish meal. And this is, this is looking at ways in which we can utilise co-product streams, whether that's CO2 flue gases, or whether that's things like food waste, to produce alternative proteins that have got a more sustainable footprint to support that farming sector. But within alternative proteins, this is a real growth area, which can also go into direct to consumers as well. Next slide, please, Sue. So the second piece, this is um, a project from our science and technology into practice stream. And this is a demonstration project that's taking automation robotic platforms to support horticultural production in the UK. So within this, people are probably aware that we've had a bit of an issue around getting labour availability within the farming sector. And this platform is looking at taking forward a range of different approaches that go from crop husbandry to fruit picking, but also using more environmentally benign treatments of crops to support their, um, their health and productivity. So what you see here is UVC treatments that are taking place on strawberry crops and trials um, this year in Kent on some of the Berry Garden farms have actually meant that there's been no need for application of fungicides to control poundry, mildew and strawberry crops. And within this, the, the partnership goes all the way from robotics companies to research-based partners right the way through to Berry Gardens that are a large cooperative that helped to drive out and deploy those technology through trials with their growers. Next slide, please, Sue. This just gives you a little snapshot of the different projects that we're supporting through our co-funding stream with China in this instance. So we're working with the Ministry of Science and Technology as our co-funding partner in China. And we've got um, eight projects up and running and off the grounds. Now this shows the UK partners and it goes all the way from um, controlled environment agriculture, trying to support more efficient and sustainable horticultural production, so plants and vegetables, right the way through to smart farm concepts. So this is taking precision ag, data, AI, to really understand what the requirements are for inputs like fertilisers, all the way through to livestock production systems and use of things like sensors and wearables to early detect things like lameness or livestock disease so that you can try it in the, treat in the right space and time to improve welfare, but also, also animal health as well. Next slide, please, Sue. And the fourth intervention that we mentioned, this is the Series A Investor Partnership Programme that we launched earlier this year. And within this, we're really looking to target company growth and scale by getting um, Series A investments, which are typically between one and three plus million going into UK businesses to support their growth and scale. And this will help to get those innovations out to the market, both in the UK, but internationally as well. Some work and analysis we did ahead of launching this scheme saw that the UK was something like 45% less competitive at capturing Series A deal flow. So we specifically launched a scheme to support this area where we use our grant funding to support companies with up to 18 months of late stage uh, project costs. And that grant investment needs to be at least um, matched double by the um, VC community. So within round one that we recently closed, we invested 5.6 million of grants, which leveraged 16 and a half million of VC investment into those companies. So the total impact of that funding was just over 22 million. And that's taken forward projects around things like technology, maturation, in auto, automation and robotics, um, lab-based meats to cellular protein production, and also precision ag to control pests and diseases. And we're, we're running around two, which is currently open. And if you want to learn more about that, there's a URL just at the bottom of the um, screen there. If we go on to the next slide, 
this is just showing um, some of the PR that's come out of those round one projects. So they've, they've literally just got off the, the ground, so they're hot out of the press. But it's showing some of those deals that are now being published with the lead investors that are supporting those particular investments. So we've got Dogtooth that's looking at um, automation robotic platforms for soft fruits. We've got Dynavel that are looking at artificial insemination in livestock production and Rosin Technologies that are taking forward um, lab-cultured meat-based programs and platforms as well. And if we go on to the final slide, this is just detailing and showing a new partnership that we're taking forward with DEFRA, which builds out from TFP program investments um, and delivery. And within this, it represents a longer term partnership and funding with DEFRA that we're going to be delivering with them over the coming years. So this will allow us to go beyond that uh, March 2024 end date to continue to support um, the agri sector. And hopefully that will allow us to continue to engage with growers and end users and mature some of those technologies through demonstration on farm uptake. We've currently got 17 and a half million available through three competitions. There's more information through these URLs if you're interested. But there's also a dedicated website um, that describes that program and some of the other opportunities that will be coming down the pipeline, which is through that farminginnovation.uki.org URL. But that's it from me. I'll hand back to Vicky um, for the rest of the presentations and session. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I was particularly interested to hear about the uh, ro robot highways that you mentioned, <laughs> and the uh, and your international outreach. That was uh, so. That was great. Thank you. So, um, our final panel member is um, Paul Davidson, challenge director for Art Sustainable Plastic Packaging, which is looking at reducing waste in the supply chain and creating sustainable recyclable materials. So, over to you, Paul. Hi everybody, I hope you can both hear and see me and see my slides. So I'll take that as a yes. So yeah, I'm Paul Davidson. I'm the challenge director for the Smart Sustainable Plastics Packaging. Oh, start my video. I've done that. Right, okay. And I want to pose the question, you know, is the road to net zero enough? So hopefully we'll come to that at the end. Can't advance my slides, let's try that. Okay, so what's the Smart Sustainable Plastics Packaging Fund? Well, it's a 60 million pound uh, fund. It's one of the um, smaller ICF challenge funds, but it's still actually the largest uh, UK government investment in sustainable plastics ever. It's a five year program. And we're looking at new technology, new knowledge, and we're trying to build new collaborative relationships as well. Um, just to look at how we feel about plastics. Well, plastic packaging is really useful. And these are all sort of the properties that make it something that's so ubiquitous in our everyday lives. The irony is that everything that makes plastic packaging really useful actually makes it really problematic when it becomes a waste when it, at its end of life. So it's really lightweight. But that, that means it's not really targeted for collection because most collection targets, local authorities are weight based. It's really efficient, but that means actually you're surrounding a large volume with a small amount of material, which makes it quite expensive to collect. It's really versatile, but that means you've got lots of different polymer types and combinations and formats, which makes it more difficult to recycle. And so it's really cost effective as a packaging material, but then that means what you recover is really low value. And it's, it's very good at protecting and preserving. And it's used, because of that, it's used a lot in contact with food. But that, the very fact it's used to be in contact with food makes its recycling more complicated. And finally, it's really good at reducing supply chain losses, which means it's used and arises as a waste right through the supply chain, which makes it different from the other packaging materials. So for all these reasons, its waste management is really complex. Now, if we move on to um, what I think are actually two significant issues with plastics we need to face here. The first one is, and this is really highlighted Blue Planet 2 and all the rest of that, was the resource and waste issue. Is that, you know, the material, the fugitive plastic. But the second one, and this has really actually um, become a lower profile, and perhaps it's just starting to rise back up again is net zero and climate change. And plastics do have a significant role here. We'll talk about that in a minute. So let's firstly look at the uh, resource and waste issue. 
Um, now, this was actually raised in a, by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in a report here. And there's a staggering fact here, is that 32% of our um, global plastics packaging leaks to the environment, becomes fugitive, so doesn't even make it into landfill. Now, as someone from the uh, plastics industry, that was a shock to me when we, this came up. And there was a little bit of sort of, well, is that figure right? Well, my, my view is that even if, that, if it was only half of that, that's still utterly unacceptable. And even the fact that that number looks plausible is a shock and cannot be right. And we have to act and do something about that. And you can see this is kind of a consequence of plastic packaging being neglected as a waste issue. But the consequence of that then becomes that it cannot be part of a, a sustainable future if we carry on like this. So we have to deal with plastic packaging, stop it becoming fugitive, and we have to then look at the reduction and the um, uh, recycling and reuse far, far more than, than we've been doing in the past. So that's kind of the, the circular economy piece. Now, let's talk about plastic packaging in terms of carbon, which is kind of the, the main thrust of today. So as a rough sort of finger in the air kind of calculation, you can say for the plastics that are used in the UK, the, the associated CO2 emissions would be somewhere between five and eight million tonnes. And I've put a chart on the right here to show the main um, CO2 emission categories for the UK, so sort of households, um, transport, etc. And you can see, well, whilst as you might expect, the production of plastic is not going to be certainly anywhere near the highest, it would appear on that chart, so it's not insignificant. The other thing that's interesting to note that is, if we move to um, the carbon that would be permitted, the, the budget, if you will, for a one and a half degree uh, rise, if we can keep that one and a half alive, then plastics production would be yes, somewhere between 17 and 20% of the allowable budget. And I'm pretty sure that society is not gonna want to use its remaining carbon budget on making plastic. So that, again, we're gonna have to do something about that. So it's very, very clear so that the, the issues around carbon and plastic production are coming very much back on the radar. So as part of our challenge, what we're trying to do is look at how the technical solutions that we're being offered, if you will, map against those two issues of resource and waste and carbon. This is our first um, an approximation, and this really is a rough guess approximation. And you can see kind of how things map against it. So, you know, Big take home is don't incinerate plastics, either for energy with waste or not, just, just don't do that. But you can see that things like reuse and refill sh should really be um, high priorities for our program. In fact, they are. And um, you can see where sort of mechanical recycling fits, but you can also see there's a whole range of uncertainty about things like biofeedstocks, about compostable polymers, where they are now, or where they're perceived to be where they actually are. Bear in mind, we have no real effective waste management for compostable materials at the moment where they could be, and what if we recycled them? So you can see that by sort of actually mapping this out properly and getting data behind that, we can start sort of saying, yeah, this is how we should start putting together a strategy for a sustainable future for plastics packaging. The other thing I want to point out is that actually plastic packaging is not just a UK issue, it's international. And one of the things that we're very pleased to be doing is to support the work in India. So we are actually, um, we just launched a, uh, we recently launched a plastics pact in India and also supporting competitions for that. And there are other announcements for international support we're doing as well that will be coming up in the near future. Some of the names that are supporting the Indian pact, I think it's the first time that Amazon has signed one of these. You see we've got Coca-Cola India there as well. So you can see these are large brands taking this issue very, very seriously now. So in summary, it's absolutely essential, I know these last sort of two weeks haven't shown anything, is that it's absolutely essential that we need to achieve that net zero position, but it's not sufficient. And if we're going to have this one planet sustainability, resource and waste issues have major, major roles to play. 
And actually, one of the things that I do see is kind of the, these are almost treated as separate issues and they're not. They're two sides of the same coin. And one of the things I would really love to see is these agendas being brought back together so that we can work on these in a more sort of holistic system, a whole system sort of approach. So that's what I wanted to say. I would say um, we've got some really exciting news coming out um, in the new year. Some of the projects we're intending to fund, so please keep an eye out for those. If you're interested in our work or in plastics and sustainability and plastics and sustainability generally, please sign up to UKCPN. It's free, and you'll get all of what we're up to, plus a lot of other stuff that's going on um, out there in this in this uh, area as well. So, with that, thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to any questions you may have. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Paul. I think, yeah, you've really highlighted the importance of that waste management cu uh, coupled with the the net zero carbon there. So, um, thank you, uh, thank you for that, and thanks to everyone who has spoken on today's um, webinar. Some really fascinating stuff coming out of the presentations that we've heard. Um, we are, if I could invite all speakers back on screen to go through um, some questions. I know I've got some um, that I'd quite like to, to ask as well. Um, and if any of the um, audience have some more questions that they'd like, that they've thought about since hearing the, uh, the presentations, and please do put them in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your, uh, your screen, and I'm sure we'll be able to get around to answering them. Um, so I suppose my reflections on on uh, across across the board were actually um, around uh, the the public and the public engagement pieces that come out in each one of the the sectors here and the challenges that you've got. So I suppose how important um, is it? And I'm just asking to, uh, uh, to the panel how important is it to engage with the public in each in in each of your challenges? Don't know who would like to start with that one. I think uh, I, I think the public need to be very much engaged because it you know does affect people's lives. It does affect uh, the decisions that 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 people um, make. Obviously, with regards to homes, uh, you know people are frankly confused at the moment. They're thinking, you know, is this going to be disruptive? Is this going to cost me a lot of money? Um, we need to help them through that process um, and you know we've got a lot of answers with regards to that we've got a lot of answers in terms of uh practicality and affordability and and so forth uh but yes we need to bring the the public along with us and you know i think we're at a a point now where there's a lot of public interest and enthusiasm um and pretty much the question i get asked is all the time is i want to do it when should I do it and what should I do? Um, and, uh, you know, gradually that will, that will, will get answers that, that, that suit every segment, let's say. You know, at the moment there are some people who you can sort of say, right, well, you know, you can, you can leap right into it right now in terms of decarbonizing your building. Others in some cases will say, well, honestly, I would wait a little bit for this or that capability technology to, to advance. Thanks, Sam. I think, Paul, you, you wanted to come in on this. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> the public is going to become increasingly important as we want to move towards things like uh, reuse and refill. So, for, ex example, for example, for recycling, most people are recycling their bottles, their pots, tubs and trays. Hopefully they're moving on to recycling the film at the um, their participating retailers, etc. But what we've seen with reuse and refill, there's a real gap, and we call it kind of like the say-do gap. We actually see a lot of people say they do um, this and buying refill products. But then when we look at the sales and retailer sales, we don't see it there. And so we have to sort of conclude that the propositions out there are insufficiently compelling. And so what we're looking for are reuse and refill that represent compelling propositions for the consumer, for the retailer, for the brand owner and for the logistics company. And what we're particularly keen on are finding solutions that are cost neutral, because there's a great risk here that we can end up with having sustainable solutions for those who can afford them, who can afford to feel good about their consumption. 
And that's not what we want to do. So we have to figure out how do we re-engineer our supply chains such that uh, we can make products available at co uh, cost competitive for everybody. And that's kind of one of the things that's actually kind of floating is becoming increasingly of a priority for us to figure out how we can do that because we can offer sustainability, but we might only be able to do that for the, the, for the well off and that's not good enough. So that's one of the real challenges that we're trying to get our arms around at the moment. Thanks, Paul. Marika, I think I'll bring you in here. Yeah, thank you. So um, there's two points I think I'd, I'd like to just mention. Um, the first one is consultation and the second one is empowerment. I think it's really important that um, we consult uh, with people on, on what's happening in their areas. And just to give you, just to talk a little bit about sustainable energy, um, obviously, Normally what happens is that a plan gets drawn up in terms of where your energy sources are, uh, what you're going to do on energy efficiency, what kind of renewables you're going to implement. And that's normally done at the local sub-regional level. And I think the key thing here is to consult with people on this. You know, it, it, it doesn't help if we're just doing things to people, I think. And um, we've recently reviewed um, all existing climate and energy plans in the UK as part of, of our programme. And what we were finding was that consultation is not yet a standard thing that we're doing as a, as a, as a, as a thing uh, in, in, in general. The second point is empowerment. And, uh, and I think that's really important. Um, particularly in the sustainable energy fields, obviously there, there is community groups that, that do things and I think they need to, to be more empowered and there's often only very small amounts of, of money available to do so. Um, and, and I think that's one of the, the things as well that, that just needs to happen at scale now to move forward with things. You know, once people can try things, you know, and see how it works, they're much more likely to get involved in it and, and to make the changes that we require. Um, so really, I think um, something to think about how we can how we can build it from the bottom up as well, not just top down. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. So I was just going to um, come in and say there's one other element with the public engagement that is absolutely fundamental to what we're doing, and that is on skills. We have to want. Um, people that are out there working on making perhaps the 2.5 million internal combustion engines that we make in the UK at the moment. We have to want to get them to want to actually move and trust that the electric vehicle battery industry is going to be a place for the future that's going to train them, uh, transfer them, you know, and, and actually give them good careers. And as we do that, we also want to be engaging children with STEM uh, and, and bringing through a pipeline of really diverse talent. Um, because these, these technologies are, you know, we're trying to catch up 120 years on the internal combustion engines that have been going into vehicles, um, and we need to really work together on it. And that's, uh, so I agree with everything everyone else has said, but just wanted to point out that actually we need doers out there as well. Thanks. And Bruce? Yeah, um, and firstly, I'd just say I absolutely agree with what Jackie's just said, uh, mm -hmm. and, and we're definitely aiming to work in, on, on all those things as, as part of the Foundation Industry Challenge. And kind of linked to that, uh, and, and in, term, in terms of the public, you know, uh, and based on what I said earlier, you know, we, we want the, the public, the, the, the buy-in public, to be putting pressure on, on the companies uh, who, who are producing the goods that, that, that they want. Um, to be going down the low carbon sustainable materials route. Uh, and we can see the, the impact that that is happening right now. You know, more and more companies that, that buy from the foundation industries setting their targets for 2030, 2035, whatever levels, you know, on the way to, to 2050. But I would also say that we need to talk to the public more uh, and do some more education because there is still an element it's not quite the right phrase, but it's a certain amount of greenwash. You know, there are, I, I see plenty of big companies out there uh, who supply the general public who are saying we're doing this, you know, in, in, in public, but then come back to their supply chain and go, we won't, we're, we're not working with you on it. We're not, we're not, we're not prepared to pay for those goods. Um, and, you know, jobs are in danger of, moving overseas. So we need to educate the public in the, the, the round of socioeconomic part of it. And that links directly back to convincing them 
that there's a future for them in those industries and they want them still in the UK in the future. Thanks, Bruce. And Tom? I and mean, I think many of the points being made uh, are very applicable to the sector we work in. I think within that regulation is probably quite an important one for us as well. So if you think back to the public and GMO crops, for example, and the European position versus outside of that, you know, it's twofold. You've got the regulatory situation about what technologies and approaches are possible for UK growers versus what is the public's appetite, apologies for the pun, in terms of taking up those, you know, those products ultimately. The other thing we've experienced is you've kind of got twofold. You've got the public, so the ultimate consumer, which we all are, but also the growers. So there's a relatively small margins and a conservatism to adopting new technology. So I was just struck around that whole C, try things out, you know, through the demonstration piece and working with particular end users. That's something that's quite important if you're taking new tech or potentially disruptive approaches to show that they work and to really gain that trust if you're going to drive and implement any sort of change. So that's something that we've got there's a potential barrier but opportunity as well if you can design the right sorts of schemes and interventions to get around that kind of barrier market failure. I think the other thing with some of the, um, I guess, really high on the on the horizon now, we've almost got a, a perfect storm around different approaches. So you've got the whole environmental piece around particularly livestock. You've got the, the welfare piece and the, you know, the health benefits piece. So I think that really is driving some of these new sectors like alternative proteins, but it's still a new nascent industry. And they're probably different products that we're not necessarily as consumers used to um, taking up. So I think it'd be really interesting to see how that piece plays out. But if there is that, if you like, driver for counting carbon or counting those sorts of other elements of food, I think how you get the standards and the, the visibility to the consumers, that could drive an implement change. But I was really struck by what Paul was saying, because what's that cost ultimately going to be? Because in the marketplace, it may be a luxury to have those sorts of things. But, um, you know, there's lots of ways in which we would probably want to continue to engage. But for us, it's probably not just the consumer. They're very, very important because ultimately, if they don't want to buy the product, there's no market for it. We've also got the producers as well. And it's uh, it's traditionally quite a long, you know, su supply chain with SMEs that don't have big budgets or margins. So it's, it's quite an interesting one to grapple with. Thanks, Tom. And uh, very briefly, from an uh, industrial decarbonisation perspective, you know, our projects are trying to build this infrastructure. And so it's going to be really crucial for them to work across all of the local authorities and the LEPs uh, and with the local residents. Um, and I think actually there's probably an opportunity there to be creative with how they are engaging with the public and how they are consulting. Um, and you know, we're starting to see that now with our with our with our projects at the moment. We've had a few um uh, questions um, come in, so thank you. There is one um, that has come for uh, Tom um, on how much social science work is being done on the major problem of changing um, attitudes uh, and hard working farmers um, for the new technologies and automation in farming. I don't know whether you're able to provide us with a bit of a response to that one at all. You might be on mute. Thank you. Sorry. Um, it's a good question. I think we've got, we don't necessarily have a dedicated social sciences stream, which some of our other challenges have got around network plus activities, but we have got through the science and technology into practice piece with the Robot Highways project that I mentioned, a strong KE element. So we're working with some of the university partners there to really make sure that are involved in the projects what is that perception? What's the outreach of those sorts of challenges and issues? So I think there's absolutely an importance and a need for that. We're probably doing it on a project by project basis rather than a defined wraparound, but that's certainly something with the DEFRA funding that we were talking about in terms of the new opportunities. What would those um, opportunities look like and how might we be able to build something in so I think we are doing it within the program but it's probably more on a project by project basis rather than a bespoke dedicated um, separate platform or pillar if you like. Thanks Tom. But I think within that there's, there's certainly something we can potentially learn from other challenges that have run those sorts of network bus elements and any sort of best practice if you like. One of the things we're looking to try and do is have a, a showcase and bringing together different projects in different areas so I think there are 
there are clearly elements we could maybe learn from other challenges and build out as we're moving towards the end of the, the programme delivery by 24. Thank you. And um, uh, this is probably a question for Sam around uh, and some of the um, areas that you uh, presented um, earlier on. Will it be affordable for building owners to decarbonise their assets or will it require significant subsidies funded by, by taxpayers? Uh, the, the answer is, uh, I think that a proportion of building owners can do it really cost effectively, whereby they, the energy savings that they're going to be gaining um, will offset and give them a really viable payback, a really economically appealing uh, payback period. Um, obviously, buildings have a sort of um, refurbishment cycle, let's say. So, you know, there's an expectation that you're gonna replace your roof from time to time and, and do various upgrades. So if you tie in the, the energy performance upgrades with that, um, then it actually doesn't cost nearly as much and it's not, it's, it doesn't really add uh, additional disruption. Um, there is, you know, as it stands today, without doubt, there is um, a, a, a gap that needs to be addressed. Um, but the government's been pretty bold on this. So there's three in the um, recent budget, there's 3.8 uh, billion going towards social housing uh, decarbonisation. So that will help bridge that gap and really kind of kickstart the market, the capability uh, and you know all the good things that we want, which is economies of scale and a really competitive um, supply side with, with regards to this. So I think it's it's a question of building up momentum, building up capability, um, and I'm optimistic that you know we'll get to the harder end of the spectrum in due course in time, um, having made loads of progress with the easier end of the spectrum over the next decade. Thanks, Sam. Um, and I suppose very uh, briefly, I, I had another uh, a question around, um, you know, what, what it, it's great to see all the work that has been progressed at, across the challenges, but what further support is needed, do you think, from government to, you know, um, take it that one step further and make, make significant change in, 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 your, in your sectors? Would anybody like to come in on, on that? Marika, yes, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I think the whole area of green finance is developing quite quickly. And I think this is really important for all of the challenges. You know, what are the finance needs? And, and sort of building on what Sam just said, I, I don't think we can fund everything with grant funding going forward. We need to start bringing private sector investment in. And what I mean by that, it's not just um, securing the private sector investment for the businesses. It's also about getting sort of large scale infrastructure sorted out and project finance will be required for that. So I see the National Infrastructure Bank as a really important player there that can unlock private sector investment to replicate and scale some of the projects that we're currently delivering as part of the overall challenges, I think. Thank you. Bruce? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I'd, I'd agree with uh, Marika on um, make, getting that finance available. I think for me, also comes back to the point that was have touched on. Um, there's a there's a need to get the regulation right ac across the board. Um, you know, the, to drive behaviour, uh, particularly in the private sector. As I said earlier today, it's been great to see uh, various governments, including the UK, making a move in in construction and saying, you know, that, that, that they're going to do exactly what Sam has been driving them towards in 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 recent in recent years. Um, but we need to see uh, the regulatory system set out so that you know the, the pri private companies uh, will move in the, move in the same direction, so that we can have it across the economy in terms of what we're trying to achieve. Thanks, Bruce. Jackie. Um, I was just going to add that I think one of the things reflecting back on the last four years, when the government makes decisions to invest, as it has done, for example, in battery technologies, if it can do it for the longer term, if it can signal that it's committed, um, actually what we then see is a great deal of 
um, strategic sort of alignment come together, both from investors and companies. And I think that's one of the things all our challenges, all our um, sort of moves in net zero need. We, we, we are really reliant on a government that is very clear on its way forward. And it's great to see those strategies published um, over the last year from the government. Thanks. And finally, Tom, on this one. I mean, I think I agree with all those points. I mean, I think regulation, you know, can we take advantage of the new relationship outside Europe to get a world leading empowering regulation system for us around new feed food products, for example, you know, that could potentially act as a beacon for inward investment. If you've got the, the companies and a system that allows you to quickly get world leading regulation of new products, I think that's something we're really interested to explore, particularly around things like alternative proteins. I think, Marika, on the finance, you know, absolutely what we, we tend to find in the sector we work in is it's not really, um, there's digital tech, but you have to fabricate products. And they're often, bad analogy, like an F1 formula racing car rather than a Ford Focus in terms of the robotics. So the price of scaling up and getting it out there can be cost prohibitive to that large scale rollout. And you need real costs coming into businesses that are probably still pre-commercial revenue. So I think building out from that Series A investor scheme that we've started would be really interesting, recognising that we are going to be in a global system competing against other companies elsewhere that may have better support mechanisms in play. I think there's that future workforce piece. So again, if you're trying to get you know smart AI young people into a sector that may be located geographically in areas that young people may not necessarily want to embrace a, a world lifestyle in, um, that's interesting. So how do we go about trying to increase and retain talent to go into this particular area rather than making a fortune in the city in, in different areas or whatever. So there's there's quite a lot of things that can come together. I mean, realistically, you could probably use some of those environmental drivers to see people wanting to come in to make a difference. And that's certainly what we've seen in some of the, the startup cultures around alternative proteins, for example. So they do buy into that whole, you know, green environmental footprint. But it's probably going to be multifaceted. And again, that, that length and duration security of funding, what we've seen with other government strategies in the past has helped to act as a commitment and a beacon to get to get funding in. So if we can get those sorts of commitments, I think it would, for us at least, be you know supporting and beneficial. Thanks, Tom. And uh, we have only got a couple of minutes left. So um, I suppose it's a quick fire round of one sentence from each of you. Um, and I'm gonna, the, the last thing that I'd like to finish on is what are you most proud of in your challenge? Um, so from a um, IDC perspective, I think knowing that we have laid the foundations um, to supporting, you know, the huge uh, and uh, increased government ambition to decarbonise our uh, industrial clusters across the UK. Uh, I'm just going to go around my screen. Jackie, coming to you next. I'm just so proud of seeing all the collaboration that's gone on over four years. And the result of that is just immensely powerful. Like we started off with people worrying about IP and, and right here, right now, you just see people moving uh, into the into the problem areas and bring solutions. It's great to see. Bruce? Yeah, I think mine, I'm afraid, is 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 both of what the two of you have just said. Um, the, the, we, we're seeing the dial move on the cal the collaborations piece, which is great, and what we set out to do. But I think also, uh, just as importantly, I feel that we're managing to put in place the the capabilities and capacities that will exist long beyond the end of our challenge and which are needed, and I, and I think that's really really key. Tom. Yes, it's quite good going after people on this panel because they say all the things you wanted to say. So thank you very much. I mean, I'd agree with that. I think it's the we've got some really bright, smart, motivated people. And that's what you really feel when you speak to the projects and see what they're doing. So I think with us, we've we've tried to support the more traditional sector. but We've also taken some bets in terms of those new industries. So I think, you know, that is absolutely what a mission programme should be about and we're really keen to see whether that does play out so the UK can become a leader in these new industries rather than exporting or importing the IP from outside so having that legacy of DEFRA funding that can hopefully continue to mature technologies I think for us is, is a really good thing and shows the good work that we've done on the TFP programme can hopefully have some sort of legacy beyond the end of the ICF funding. Paul? 
think I'm going to take the comment of collaboration, which I absolutely, absolutely agree 100% with, and raise that to actually people putting money where their mouth is as well. When we started this challenge, we were set some quite challenging and stretching co-investment targets, and we were kind of going, are the projects out there? Do people really want to do this? You know, is the money there to be uh, to be done with these? And we specifically said we are going to fund fewer but larger projects, which is more risky. And we found that yeah, absolutely, that the the industry at large has been really keen to come alongside with us. So you know, it's been great to see these larger projects being de-risked by us, taking shape, and actually a bit like in a following wind changing and moving the dial where we need to go so that's the thing that i really kind of like to see, you know that i feel really sort of happy about as we're moving forward Marika? tricky uh, i think <laughs> I'm, I'm probably most proud of the fact that uh we have this this is obviously the first smart local energy system sort of program so i'm uh quite proud of the fact i guess that we we are recognizing the importance of the project developer in all of this. These are complex projects. And so I'm proud of the fact that we're developing a toolkit now for local authorities in terms of how to, to de develop and deliver smart local energy systems, because I think um, providing best practice is really important in terms of moving uh, forward on the net zero journey. And, and I think we've achieved that or we're starting to achieve that. And finally, Sam. Yeah, I'm going to go with two things I'm proud of. One is, is we've won over the really important stakeholders. You know, we've, we've set out to transform construction. There's a lot of scepticism out there, but we have won over government procurement and a bunch of other procurers. So I'm really proud of that. And then another thing is um, Google has invested just under $20 million in one of our supported SMEs. So again, that is a sign that, you know, there's a real acknowledgement that there is value there and that, you know, there's, 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 there's change afoot. Great, thank you. And apologies that we're slightly um, over the uh, the time that we were allotted, but thank you ever so much to all of our panelists and the questions that um, that have come in. Um, and that wraps up the um, final ISCF webinar series um, on sustainability. So thank you, everyone. Have a super day. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.